am Dr. Marcus Schmidt. And I'm Dr. Helmut Schmidt. For this video, we will be talking about insomnia. Insomnia is a difficulty initiating sleep, difficulty maintaining sleep, or non-refreshing sleep. It is very common. Somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of all Americans experience insomnia at some point in any given year. I think it, uh, we, should, we should remember that it is very common, but mainly because I think also because it, insomnia occurs in so many different uh, uh, disorders, medical disorders, psychiatric disorders, and other sleep-related disorders. It's a, we like to look at it as a symptom uh, instead of a disorder, although we do know that there are some patients who do have, uh, just by their nature, uh, difficulty with insomnia. Uh, as far as a symptom, I like to look at it as a, uh, like a fever. Uh, many things can cause a fever, just as many things can really cause insomnia. Uh, sleep disorder breathing, like sleep apnea, can cause insomnia. And the most subtle upper air resistance syndrome, uh, most subtle problems of difficulty breathing and sleep. Snoring. Can, can present that. actually as insomnia without actually having snoring. That's right. And restless leg syndrome, other I issues like that can also be a cause of insomnia. Now, how to treat insomnia? You know, as best we can, we like to treat that underlying problem. If there's a sleep apnea problem, we want to treat that. Restless legs, we want to treat the restless legs. Uh, but that put aside, it is very common for patients, to, particularly those that have a longer lasting insomnia, to develop a lot of bad habits. What, what some people refer to as conditioned insomnia. They begin to associate their bed as a place of frustration and worry. That is, you know, they may feel sleepy and tired on the couch watching television, then they go to bed and then they think, oh boy, here we go, it's going to be a bad night and they think of that situation as going to be very difficult for them, and uh, they start to worry about it. And those kinds of insomnias more typically are sleep onset insomnia, initial insomnia, rather than uh, waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to go back to sleep. Once these people go to sleep, actually, they may sleep through for a number of hours. That's right. Now, if there's a breathing problem or something else, that may disrupt sleep later on. There are two pillars of insomnia therapy that we really try to stress here at the Ohio Sleep Medicine Institute. One of them is sleep restriction therapy, and the other is stimulus control therapy, which we're going to talk about. But I just want to make sure that the viewers understand that these two techniques are part of what we call, or at least are utilized as part of what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. There are other things that come into cognitive behavioral therapy as well. Cognitive behavioral therapy, if you compare that to medications for treating insomnia, medications that, that we use for sleep aids, for example. And you look at one year of use of a sleep aid versus cognitive behavioral therapy, this research is pretty clear. Cognitive behavioral therapy outperforms uh, medications to help you. It's very helpful. And when I talk to my patients in the clinic, I give them a lot of information, and sometimes I feel that it's a little too much for them. So this video is to really help you in particular. One of those pillars is something we call uh, sleep restriction therapy. It is very natural for patients who have insomnia to s decide, you know, I'm going to sleep in, make up for that bad night. But the problem is when they sleep in, they actually make the problem worse. And the reason is, is that by getting up instead of at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning like they normally would have, now they're getting up at 11 o'clock in the morning and they reset their biological clock to a later bedtime. I think that's an important point to remember that it's not so much that going to bedtime that sets the in internal clock in your brain, but it's the get-up time that actually really sets the clock time in your brain. So if you normally get up at 8 o'clock and you're getting up uh, in the weekend, you sleep in to make up for that bad night, and you're getting up now at 11 o'clock, that's a three-hour shift. You've basically gone to California for three days or two days. Now comes Sunday night, the individual wants to try and get to sleep, and guess what? It's very difficult. They have to now go to bed three hours earlier. The brain says if wake-up time is 11 o'clock, that means the bedtime is more like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So then you may be creating a little bit what we call a delayed sleep phase syndrome. They, get, they change that rhythm in the clock and it makes it very difficult. What we recommend is to spend only the amount of time in bed that you actually need. If you require seven and a half hours of sleep, then you want to restrict the time in bed to about that time. That is, if you are spending 10 hours or more in bed and you only need, say, 8, that's to be conservative, then you're really going to be guaranteeing yourself at least 2 hours of insomnia, either the beginning of the night, the middle of the night, or the end of the night. The brain simply distributes the sleep that you need over the time and the hours that you give it. But if, you, if you've gone to 
bed three hours later than you really wanted to, or go to sleep three hours later than you really wanted to. You don't want to shift all of that three hours all at once. You want to do it stepwise over, over a number of days or a week or two to back off by, let's say, half an hour at a time. And, and if you still are awake too much time, go back another hour, less half an hour of time in bed. So over a several day period to kind of march back to yeah, the time period that you need. And you may need to do it over a week or two or so. Now this, this is, can be a little frightening for patients because they say, you know, if I get up at 8 o'clock in the morning, no matter what kind of bad night I've had, they think, my goodness, it's going to be a horrible day. I'm going to feel awful. And they, there's a tendency for patients to, as we say, catastrophize about this situation, to think it's going to be bad. And that thinking, that looking at sleep in that way is a, is a must, an absolute necessity to get that sleep, actually makes it worse. You can think of yourself as looking at the clock, sort of counting down how many minutes or hours you have left to sleep, and it can be very anxiety provoking. The other, the other aspect that it may be counterproductive to all of this is trying to compensate by having a nap during the daytime. You, you don't want to do that. A nap, if especially when it's longer than 20 minutes, the more you sleep during the daytime, the less you're going to be able to sleep at night. You want to, you want to build up or maintain that sleep drive need at night time. That sleep pressure. That is, that's right. So I tell my patients, turn a negative into a positive. If you've had a bad night, actually that can be very helpful. That sleep debt that you accumulate during that night can now help you initiate and maintain sleep the following night. And that's very, very important. So it may be a couple of nights where you're going to have some difficulty, but that short-term pain has hopefully long-term gain. Now, that's one of the pillars, sleep restriction therapy. It is very, very important to follow that. The other pillar of insomnia therapy is something we call stimulus control therapy. Now, what is stimulus control therapy? It's a fancy term to really describe, to, dis to, to break that association of your bed as a place of frustration. One of the things we recommend is not to watch the clock. If you are watching the clock, you need to turn that clock around. If that doesn't work, get the clock out of the bedroom. Exactly. Uh, the other thing to do is not spend more than 20 or 30 minutes in bed without sleeping. If you really can't sleep in 20 or 30 minutes, get out of bed. Go to a different room. Read uh, it with lower lighting. I really recommend patients not to watch television, not to look into the, or work on the computer, because by staring into a light source, that actually tells the brain that it's daytime, and it may actually make this insomnia worse. After 20 or 30 minutes of reading, go back to bed and try it again. If it's still you're having trouble, get out of bed and do it all over again. And if you do it all night, you do it all night. I think that the, the light source is important, uh, especially if it's bright light, like we're looking at right now, bright light. You don't want that in the evening time. You want, you want to dim it down to allow the brain to settle down and, and, and not have its clock reset. That's right. Low, lower light intensity at night, but maximize the light in the morning. As far as the alarm goes off, the, 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 you want the curtains open, getting as much light in as possible. So those two things, sleep restriction therapy and stimulus control therapy, really help you uh, consolidate sleep at night. The final thing I was going to say is just sleep hygiene, good sleep hygiene. And on the website, there is a very nice description of the do's and don'ts and how to maintain good sleep hygiene. I think that, that's a very good common sense type of approach to a very common problem. Uh, the other aspect uh, may be that uh, to, to consider that uh, no sleep, uh, unless you've got this familial insomnia problem that exists in a very rare situation, it's not going to kill you. And uh, uh, do not worry about it. Relax. It will. If you just, the more you worry about it, the more you're concerned about it, the more it's going to make it worse. That's right. Yeah. For more information, please call our clinic at 614-766-0773 or visit our website at www.sleepmedicine.com.